Please. It's okay. People can finish their conversations. <laughs> well, since we don't have Franky. Reni me kasher at menu le hol at sadikim hamitim shpadonu no hol at sadikim hamitim shochna afad akdoshim baret lema ubifat harbin akdosh sadik isodulam nachan ben mekochamal ben Nachman ben Feiga ben Simcha nach nach ben Nachman Yuman zehuto zehutam yagen alenu ve'akol amir shal amen kani ratzon. We're going to do this class bezat Hashem for the refuah shlema and a speedy recovery for the nefesh the ruach and the neshama of any names that anybody wants to say we can start adding them now. Tila da Sabet Ben Basalana Pinchas Ben Yehuda Pinchas Ben Kamuna Dov Ben Kamuna Yaakov Ben Berta Esther Batra Rivka Bat Estamaka Sarah Batra Binyam Ben Khana Batya Bat Sarah Shimon Ben Jacqueline Shani Chaya Bat Miriam Yermiro Avram Ben Soda uh, Reuven Ben Zohara, Yechal Miel Daniel Ben Tovabasha, Avram Ben Mesaudi, Harinissim Ben Yamna, Benjamin Mer Ben, um, I just wrote this one down. Who gave me the first name, Benjamin Mer? I think it's Frankie's grandson. Oh, Ben Sasha was writing. Benjamin Mer Ben Sasha. Um, Rafael Yaakov Ben Rachel Tila Hadassah Bat Ilana Esther Bat Margarita Yoshua Yaakov Ben Orna Rachel Batsa Ronit Bat Bracha Pesach Ben Ben Yosef Asara. We can. Slicha. Can. Bat Lawrence. Bat Lawrence. Asher Naji? Ben Perach. Bekol acholim shalam Yisrael, en la refan alem, en la refan alem, en la refan alem, yisrut kol atzadikim, elahem, refu ashlema, refu atanefesh, refu ataguf, amen keratzon. Let's do uh, also this class in the honor of the people that have passed away for Ilulot, that have passed away this week, this year, whenever, for the elevation of any nishamot. May all their neshamot be uh, put back into the resting place and help in the hopefully bringing of the Mashiach and the completion of their souls. I'll start. Elazar ve Ben David ve Ochama, Rosat Bapacha, Menashe Ben Rachel ve Nesod, Clara Oit bat Simcha Moshe, Madi Sebaun bat Yujin Gnasser, Rabanit Mazal Tov bat Bochapin Tov, Nisim Ben Esther, Edmo Ochami Ben Shalmajaj, Jinet Nina Chaya bat Yosef Gedalia, Naftali Daniel Ben Solika, Razal bat Pachel, Rachel Achaya Afa bat Victor Miriam, Simon bat Chana, Ilan Mesika Ben Shoshana, Yarden Ben Orli, Yaakov Ben Miriam, Chaya Bat Perla, Solika Bat Mazal, David Shlomo Ben Solika, Adasa Bat Esther Zlata, Adasa Bat Esther Zlata, Eli Ben Simcha, Eli Ben Simcha, Ruby Bat Esther, Ruby Bat Esther, Felix Ben, Felix Ben Esther, and to all the Nishamot that passed away. All the people that passed away, also Akdishut, Hashem, people in Mehron, people around the world. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's jump right into the parsha of the week and continue the class as we usually do. So we're back on the schedule of doing the parsha of the week. Um, tonight I'm going to take probably the majority of the class, but Moshe is next to me. If he has some ideas or thoughts, he might jump in a little bit. Uh, yeah, in a little bit, but hopefully not for a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God. So this week's parasha is Parashat Balak, um, which is a very unique parasha because in reality, um, first of all, it's a parasha that's named after Rasha. So it's unique in the sense that it's a parasha that one has a certain amount of negative energy that comes from it because of the name Balak. It says in the Kabbalah that and if a person carries a name of a Rasha, the name that them too will also be a Rasha. It's also referenced in the Gemara for that purpose as well. That's why it's very important what we name kids and what we name people and the names that we give people even whenever we're joking around because the name of a person also gives a certain amount of spiritual energy behind it. it shows you a lot of importance behind it. That's the first step and that's the first thing I want to discuss. We'll go a little bit into why this Barasha is called Balak. 
and why it's interesting that the Pasha is called Balak. It could have been called anything. It could have been, what, how does the Pasha start off? Vayar Balak, right? Yeah, Ben Zipor. Yeah, Ben Zipor. So it um, could have been a Pasha called, uh, I don't know, it says, uh, yeah, and then it's a, okay, yeah, exactly. Vayar Balak, Ben Zipor, et kol Asher. Yeah, exactly. So the Pasha could have been called Vayar, right? We had Pasha called Vayera. So there's, Pasha could be called different types of names. Specifically, it's chosen to be named Balak, so there's a reason for that. We're going to hopefully get into that in a little bit. And um, and also, there's something also very interesting in this Pasha, aside from the fact that it seems very um, fairy tale like because there's these concepts with um, korbanot, there's these uh, these offerings that they're doing, and they're trying to curse Bnei Israel, and they're doing all these sacrifices, and they're trying to curse them, but then they end up being blessed. Mm -hmm. And there's all these very mystical things that are happening in this parasha that, that's very bizarre. The Zohar says that this is actually, even though it's called Parashat Balak, it's called Sefer Balak in the Zohar, and reference also in different types of books. So there's a reason why there's a lot of significance around this parasha. And the last thing that we're going to try to indulge in and also try to understand with this parasha is that specifically, it's a parasha that has no mitzvah. It's the only parasha that has no mitzvot in it. Okay, so there's a reason for that. And we're going to try to get into that as well. The Ramban Nachmanides, Right, and so it's not ironic because, anyways, this class discusses the teachings of Rabbi Nachman of Breslev. But the Ramban writes something famously, saying that whoever he would, he essentially gave a lot of blessing, and he said merit to the person who finds a mitzvah in this parasha, meaning that it's impossible that the Torah has a parasha that doesn't have a mitzvah in it. But why is that this one doesn't have a mitzvah? And no one ever has said what the mitzvah is in this parasha, but there must be a mitzvah. So we're going to try tonight to find, through the commentary of Rabbi Nachman of Breslev, what the mitzvah of this parasha is. Okay? With that being said, we're going to go into a little bit of the background of the parasha, like we usually do. And then after that, we're going to try to break it down with the commentary of the Zohar, the Aizal, Rabbi Nachman of Breslev, depending on what is relevant, to try to explain what happened here. Now, I'm not going to go into all the different parts. I'm going to, I'm going to mostly concentrate on the beginning of the parasha, which is the discussions and how... Balak wanted to recruit Bilam to curse Bnei Israel and, es and essentially destroy Bnei Israel through the curse. Not after the other parts and the sins of the Jewish people and all the other details that happen. Uh, we have a little Gilgul here that wants to come into the class and <laughs> listen to what we're going to talk about. So the Pasha says, as Menachem was saying in the very beginning, Vayach Balak ben Sipor. Right? So there's something very interesting over here. It says that Balak is the son of Tzipor. What does Tzipor translate to in Hebrew? Bird. Bird, exactly. So, Pshat is that the name of his father was Tzipor, right? Now, mystically, there's a book called Magid Mesharim. Magid Mesharim is a book by the teachings of Rav Yosef Kao, who was the author of the Shulchan Aruch, was a very, very special halacha master and also studied with angels and other things, which is hence the name of the book. Magid is a form of an angel, okay? It's a different type of an angel. Now, Rav Yosef Kaol, should give a little bit of background in the special story that I was listening to in a class on the reason why, um, how, the, how this came about that Rav Yosef Kaol had the opportunity to learn with an angel for many years of his life. And in the book, Magid Mishayim, are the teachings that he shares from what he learned from this angel. Now, the way that this happened is when Rav Yosef Kao was very young, and just a little background, Rav Yosef Kao was the main rabbi and the halachic master of uh, Tzfat at the time, about the same time as the Arizal and the Ramak, Rabbi Moshe Kodivero, who was, they were both masters of Kabbalah. Um, I believe it was the 16th century, so we're looking at about you know 500 years ago or so. And somewhere in that range, we had these very, very holy tzadikim. Now, Rav Yosef Kao, when he's very young, he's very famous for studying, of course, as people that are attached to halakha, uh, study a lot of Mishnayot. And he started to study Mishnayot endlessly as a child, to the point that when people used to fall asleep on Friday night, on Shabbat, he would stay up late and study Mishnayot, to the point that it got that every year he was finishing, um, you know, the Shas of Mishnayot. But then it started doing it that he would finish it even on a monthly basis, on a weekly basis. He was just reading Mishnah so many times that he fell in love with it. It was the only indulgence that he really had in terms of studying of Torah. And he loved Mishnah so much from even when he, was a, when he was a young child, through his bar mitzvah years, around the time when he was 20, from the way I understood from the story, he was one time staying up and he was studying on Friday nights. And he had this event that happened that when he was studying Mishnah alone at night, he felt this strike in the back of his neck and he couldn't move, he was almost paralyzed. And as he was trying to realize what had hit him, then words started to come out of his mouth that were uncontrollable, that were not from his own mouth, and it was speech that was coming from a Magid. It was speech that was a heavenly voice that was coming from him, it was an angel. 
And this angel said, I am the angel that is birthed from all the Mishnayot that you birthed and you brought into the world and that you studied. And this was the Magid that said, from now on, I'm going to come with the strength of the Mishnayot and teach you the secrets of the Torah. And this is a story about how Rav Yosef Kawa began with Magid, uh, Magid Meshaim. And in the book of Magid Meshaim, specifically on the section with Balak, this, this week, he says like this. He says, Ben Sipur Mamash, meaning, if you translate the word Mamash, meaning actually, right? Whenever you look at the thing, when Yaakov sent angels, it says that he sent in messengers or he sent angels to his brothers. It says, Rashi says, Malachim Mamash, meaning actual angels, okay? So when it says Mamash, he's saying it's actual angels. Over here, something very interesting, Rabbi Yosef Kawa was starting off the Pasha by telling us immediately that he was, the son of a, he was the son of a bird. Kabbalistically, what had happened is between his father and his mother, they had relations with the bird, and he was actually birthed from a bird. Many people that actually study the books of the Arizal and the Zohar on this week's Pasha are going to realize that Balak and Bilam were both masters of black magic and prophecy. Okay? Part of this stems from illicit relations, negative energy, bad things that were happening. A lot of it came from the teachings that came from Egypt, but actually even before that, it stemmed from the things that came from Lavan and Lot. Okay, we're gonna get into that in a little bit. Now, the reason why this is actually important is because mystically what was happening here in this parasha is Balak, the king of Moab, right? One of the two nations that we're not allowed to marry with, one of the forbidden nations, one of the army nations that we were going to fight against, and actually the nation that David Amelach actually comes from. Now, mystically, I didn't really go too much into this, but there's quite a bit for those that want to actually research this. Mystically speaking, Moab knew that within them was going to come a very great prophet. They knew, they didn't know it was David Amelach, but they knew someone incredible was going to come from them. And the Gemara says that we're not supposed to marry from Moab. They, and there's an argument in the Gemara that says that we're not supposed to, art, exactly, we're not supposed to do between either men and women or just the men. That's why, obviously, Ruth comes from Moab, and Ruth is a femme, is, is a woman, and because women were allowed to be taken and be able to be converted, women were actually able to come from Moab, and then eventually it led to the birth of Delina. So from even the greatest darkness of wherever we're not allowed to go marry, came one of the greatest prophets, okay. and uh, essentially the Mashiach. Good point, because that's really what it all comes down to. Now, he's the king of Moab. And wants to destroy Bnei Israel. He sees them go to war with Sihon and the other nations. They left Egypt. He saw the things that happened with Amalek. And he wants to destroy Bnei Israel, right? As also, mystically, because there's also a connection to Tzipor, he also had the capacity through black magic because Balak, it said, had even more black magic than Paro in Egypt. To the point that he was hovering and he was floating up and he was using different divine names and prophecy and different types of things to be able to go look at the Jews and do things to bring curses and Ainara upon them to try to fight them bring negative energy, negative angels to go fight to combat the Jewish angels that were protecting the Jewish people. And there's even references to it in the Tzukim that you'll see whenever they want to talk to them. It's, it says messengers, but you can read it as angels, and there's different types of things like that. Now, you have Barak, the king of Moab, that wants to destroy the Jewish people, and he needs help to be able to do that. Now, you have on the other hand, a very, very special, we'll say in parentheses, character in this week's Pasha, which is Bil'am. Bil'am is the equivalent of Moshe Rabbeinu, but for the dark side. Because there's a Midrash that discusses that all the, all the nations of the world were gonna to come to Hashem and they were gonna say, how is it possible that we were able to combat the Jewish people and the strength of the Jewish people when they had Moshe? And Hashem said, I gave you Bilam. So Bilam had the amount of energy and spiritual prophecy that Moshe had, and even some argue say even more. Because from a negative capacity, it's always easier to do work than from the positive capacity. Just as it's much easier to be able to destroy something than it is to be able to build something. You can destroy something in two seconds, it can take you years to build something. Bilham even had the capacity to have prophecy at times when Moshe Rabbeinu could not have prophecy. So just to tell you the strength of the two negative characters that we're talking about in this week's parasha, and to show you the strength. The Zohar says in this week's parasha that the incident that was happening here with the cursing of the Jewish people was more grave than the Jewish people's slavery in Egypt. We're going to go through this parasha and we're going to say, oh, it's just two random people that want to curse the Jews. There's many, many people that didn't take this parasha at face value, and it was much, much greater than that. The point that the, they actually wanted to destroy the Jewish people, the Jewish people could have been destroyed then and there through the curses that they were trying to perform. We're going to understand tonight how powerful these curses are and how special it was what happened here and what Hashem had done to be able to protect the Jewish people. So Balak, the king of Moab, is now recruiting and bringing in the greatest prophet of the negative forces, which is Bilam. 
It's funny you say that. Go ahead. Because Yari Kadosh writes right here. It says in the Pasuk, Velo kam navi od be Yisrael ki Moshe. And there was not a prophet that arose from Yisrael like Moshe. And funny enough, what did Yari write? Specifically in Yisrael, but there was someone from the other nation called Bil'am, who was just as equivalent, if not, who had something that even Moshe couldn't do. Yeah. Which is prophecy like uh, on demand. And we see many times the Torah writes that uh, Bil'am had did disgusting things uh, like relations with his donkey and stuff like that that are beyond our understanding to really receive lots of koach and bad things but that's just uh, it's thing. true that's that's part of the reasons why he was able to pull for so much negative energies because of course of all the aviahot and all the different types of things that he did that gave him a tremendous amount of strength from the fo from the force of the kippa as we reference in the books of the kabbalah the negative energy side where he was able to combat the jewish people mystically speaking and spiritually speaking now bilam actually was a descendant the grandson of lavan okay lavan we know from the story in the times of yaakov that lavan himself was a master of black magic and lavan himself was one of the reasons it's also very deep over there, and we've done some classes on it as well. And you can look at a lot of commentary on those pashrut. I'm sure if you look at the Zohar and Arizal, it discuss the strength of what it took for Yaakov, even when Yaakov had left after receiving the blessing from his father Yitzchak and had combated Esav. He was arguing with um, Esav at the time. He was arguing with his mother. He didn't know what was worse, to go and fight Esav head on, who was also a massive form of negative energy, massive klipa that comes from Esav, which is the aspect of Rome. And then he also didn't know if he wanted to go to Lavan, which was a massive form of idolatry also and black magic. So he didn't know what to do because if he stayed at home, he had to combat Esav. And if he left and followed his mother's instruction, which he eventually ended up doing, he went to Lavan. Now, there's reasons why he had to go to Lavan because he obviously had to rescue two very special souls that were in the house of that black magic, which were eventually become his wives and the two maidservants, which would be his extra two wives. And from there, all of Bnei Esav comes. To, so to show you how the Tzaddik passes through this journey of going through and combating all the dark negative and energy in the world, like just as Moshe had to go into Egypt, Yaakov had to go into the house of Lavan, to go rescue these very special souls, to bring about the salvation in his zivug, and bring about the future generations of Amishal. Bil'am comes from the same negative energy as Lavan. Okay? Gilgulim. And Gilgulim as well. There's also people that will discuss how some of the negative energy comes also back from Cain, and also some people say from Esav as well. Part of it, some people I think say... I don't know where I was looking at this commentary. Someone was talking about it, but I didn't see the source for it, about how there was a part of Gilgul of Esav in Balak. So sorry, he says that in, in the Ariza, it explains that the negative energy of Cain and Abel, it was the uh, Bilam. And the positive energy that Abel had and the Cain will have, it's, it's more shaven. Shaven. Yeah, <laughs> It's a fantastic point. Shlomo brings up a good point that in, in reality, when you have these stories of these very, very special people, there's lots of different types that happen, different types of things that happen in reincarnations, especially when you look at the book Shara Gilgulim, written by the Arizal, or written by Rav Khan Vital on the teachings of the Arizal, you go through um, a tremendous amount of depth behind how every person's actions have a reaction or a person has to do a specific type of correction in the world. This is why some people have different character traits. This is why people are born into different lifestyles, different types of means, different types of eventually leading them to different types of ends. It's because everybody has different types of rectifications and things they need to go through. Now, Cain and Heaven were preliminarily two very, very incredible and great tzaddikim. They were very, very special people. Keep in mind that Adam HaRishon, even whenever you go back to the concept of Adam HaRishon, Adam HaRishon was the greatest tzaddik that was ever created in the world. Hashem created the perfection of himself in man. And as it started to get lower and lower and, and descend more, there started to become more and more breaking of this greatness and this light of God that exists in the world. Cain and Hevel had a tremendous amount of light. Now, when there was damage that was caused, it needed to be rectified eventually years later. Parts of those actions had to be rectified. Some of that negative energy, like Shemua was saying, came into different parts of other different types of people. And that energy was pulled either by negative energy that was influenced by either negative angels or negative beings or the Satan himself, or it was pulled by positive energy and good actions and being able to rectify and bring the world back to its original state. Now, back to the connection over here, because Bilam and Balak now are trying to do this special unification, Balak sends messengers and a letter to Bilam to be able to recruit him to be able to curse B'nai Ishan. And this is just kind of like giving a little bit of the background story, what's happening here and what's going on. As this is all happening, it's a famous pasuk that's quoted from Yeshayahu in uh, 4114, right? Mem Aleph Yudalet, that says, Al tiri 
Tolat Yaakov, right? Just to show you the connection over here. It's a pasuk that references not to fear the worm Yaakov, essentially a reference to the worm Yaakov in the pasuk, which is a reference to the fact that there's a very special worm, the Tolat, that was also used in the Beit HaMikdash, and it forms a specific type of silk, right? As we know that specific types of worms have the capacity through their mouth and the way that they use their saliva, they can form a, a specific type of silk, which is one of the most uh, expensive materials that exist in the world today um, in terms of fabrics. And the blessing that was referenced in the Pasuk was to say how just as the worm through his mouth creates one of the most precious materials that is used by man, so too, just as a Jew uses his mouth in prayer, it's also one of the most precious materials to God. So the prayer of Jew is compared to Yaakov as the Tolat Shani and referencing Yaakov. Keep in mind, there's a, the importance of this pasuk is important because Bil'am pulls his strength from Lavan, just as the Tzadikim and Bnei Yisrael come from Yaakov. And Yaakov had to do this in the, the reference of the silk and the power of the Jewish people, which come from Yaakov, Bnei Yisrael, the other name of Yaakov, comes from this Tolat, comes from the mouth, which is this worm, as prayer. Okay? David HaMelech, of course, in Tehidim. Many Tzadikim have referenced themselves as worms themselves. They've also referenced themselves as dirt. Worms themselves lie themselves in the lowest place, which is considered dirt. And there's lots of reasons for this, but this is just some of the ideas behind the depth behind the, the reference of Tolat, uh, Tolat Yaakov, okay? Now, now that we know that the Jewish people have this, has this aspect of prayer, we're gonna start delving a little bit deeper into what's happening here with Balak and Bilam that's not written in the Tasha. Balak and Bilham, the Arizal says, they saw through prophecy and they saw the strength. They even saw how Moshe and Aaron were gonna pass away. They saw that the Jewish people, the prophets of the Jewish people, were going to pass away in mountains. What's the significance of mountains? If you look at it, there's actually a lot of significance to mountains. The Jewish people went up to Avram to Yitzchak to the mountain, Aramoria, to be able to do Akedat Yitzchak. The Jewish people on Har Sinai received the Torah through a mountain. Right? And you have lots of stories that involve mountains and the Jewish people and being able to elevate themselves. It's the highest form of elevation in terms of natural build, right? And natural landscape. And then aside from all of that, Moshe passed away on a mountain. You have the same thing happening with Aaron as well. So they said, the Arizal explains, that Balak wanted to grab Bilham and take him to the mountains to be able to curse the Jews from the mountains as well, to gain the strength of mountains. So just to show you mystically, it's not that they're just going to mountains and they're going to make altars. It's also the same significance that the Jewish people, they prepared themselves with altars and they tried to do rectifications for the Egel Azav whenever they stood by Har Sinai. They're also doing altars over here and bringing korbanot to try to dismantle and destroy the Jewish people mystically through their curses. And then also do the same thing as just as the Jews received the Torah through the mountain, he wants to dismantle the Jewish people in the Torah through their curses on the mountain. Okay, this is the Arizal. The Zohar says, as I was saying a little bit earlier in the class, that the black magic that existed here, Balak had, and like I was saying earlier, Bil'am pulled more from a sense of prophecy, meaning Bil'am would have actual prophecy in connection with Hashem. Some people argue and say that Bil'am could have prophecy when he was asleep, and most prophets had only prophecy when they were asleep, and he would have it when he was asleep, but nonetheless, he was more of the prophet, and Balak was the one that pulled more from black magic and the negative energy. Like I was telling you, he was able to do things to be able to bring Ayn Aha into the world, bring destruction, bring negative angels, and do this type of stuff. Now, as you see them coming to the mountain, and I'm not gonna go through the whole story in the parasha, but what ends up happening is Balak calls Bilam. And after they join themselves together, they prepare themselves. There's this concept that's discussed that says that there's eight seconds that exist in the world, and Arizal talks about it, how there's eight seconds that exist every single day where Hashem shows his anger. Now, we don't know it, but through prophecy, Bil'am and, uh, Bil and Balak, knew the eight seconds that Hashem completely loses Rachmanut over Am Yisrael. And if you can pray or you can curse in those moments, or sometimes something happens in those moments, then what can be brought about is very, very, very bad. Just to talk about that concept for just a quick second, that is eight seconds that's very, very, very bad for the Jewish people. It's per se that God gets angry. Now, there are other moments during the day that aren't necessarily God's negative energy, but there's times where he has very positive energy, where there's better energy, where there's energies of judgment, there's energies of Rachmanut, there's energies of Chesed that exist in the world. There's energies where good things can happen or good things can be manifested, or it's more difficult to manifest. A good example of this is Tikkun Chatzot. When people wake up in the middle of the night, 
It's one of the best and the holiest times where God's mercy is the most abundant in the world is right at the time in the middle of the night. Not specifically midnight, but midnight according to the Jewish calendar. Okay? And they knew, Kabbalistically, even the Jewish people didn't know, when there was these eight seconds that God had this form of anger that exists in the world. And they knew that if they brought through their prophecy and through their black magic and through their Ainara, a prayer or a curse in this moment, they could destroy the Jewish people. Through the preparations, through the altars, and through the other things that they did in the right moment, at the right time, in the right prayers, in the right meditations before, they prepared themselves to be able to do this. The first time they did it, Bil'am began and prepared according to Balak because Balak knew that Bil'am had to be the one to speak because he was the one that came from Lavan and what knew the power of the strength of the mouth of Yaakov so he knew how to combat the Jews through prayer. He was going to curse them through his mouth to combat the Tola at Yaakov. He now told, Balak told Bidam, I want you to curse the Jewish people. Now the word that they wanted to use was the word Kelem, which is a reference to destruction. Okay? And what was going to happen is through their meditations and their prayers and their sacrifices, when the eight seconds hit, they were going to say the word Kelem. And in that moment, they were going to destroy the Jewish people in one shot. That's why the Zohar says that in that moment, it was more dangerous than the Jewish people in Egypt. This is the power of the black magic that they had. We still don't understand why it's so powerful, but we'll get there in a little bit, okay? They try this multiple times. The first time Bilam goes, he can't even say a word. Bilam then goes back to Balak. He says, let me go talk to Hashem. He goes through this process where he essentially is going to go sleep or go off to the side and he's going to be able to speak to Hashem and then see what's going on and why it didn't work in those eight seconds because there was a protection and Hashem protected them in that moment. After that happens, he then goes back and they discuss with Balak again. The Zohar discusses how they go into a room, they discuss the secrets of their ancestry and their black magic, and nobody knows these secrets. The Zohar says nobody knows what happened there. No one knows the secret that Balak had that no one else had. Tonight we're going to try to understand what the secret that Balak had in that room. They go back a second time, and then what happens, obviously as we know, there was the blessing of Bnei Yisrael with the second curse. And then the third time, which I believe there was three times that Balak and Bilam do this procedure where they're trying to curse and then they eventually end up trying to curse, but it ends up being a blessing. We know obviously the, the blessing, which is um, which is the famous saying that we say, the Jewish people say every single day, which is the blessing of the Jewish people that blesses Yaakov. Obviously there's a connection between, as Bilam is speaking in reference to Lavan, there's a blessing towards Yaakov, right? the, the, um, the, the dwelling place and the holiness and the Kedushah of all of Am Yisrael through Yaakov. And through the wanting to curse, he ends up actually being able to bless. There's this insane concept of how is it possible that a person can do, and through this black magic and all this stuff that's happening, right? We bring back up the main questions that we had earlier. How is it possible, we'll get into the concept of why the parasha is named after Rasha, but how is it possible, not only that there's no mitzvot, but why is it that it's so deep? What's so powerful about what's going on over here? And why is it that it's so dark as the Zohar is saying what's happening? And why is it there's no mitzvot in this parasha? And to be able to begin to answer all of this, I'd like to go back to the story of Cain and Evel, as Rabbi Natan would bring down. Rabbi Natan brings down that, and this is the first time that I learned this commentary, I never heard this understanding or this commentary on the story of Cain and Evel. We know that Cain and Evel brought korbanot in front of Hashem to be able to bring something as a commemoration and to be able to get close to Hashem. Now, Rabbi Natan says something very special. He says, they were arguing on whether or not a Jewish person or neshama or human being at that needs to pray in this world. That was the argument of Kain and Evel. If prayer should exist. What does that mean? Kain came and he gave a grain offering. Kain was arguing with Hevel by saying that the Jewish people by the curse of Adam have to work and toil the earth. Meaning that there is no relying on Hashem and praying to Hashem and talking to Hashem. In fact, the Torah doesn't even reference prayer until Noah. So there is no concept of prayer yet. And what they're trying to figure out in the first machloket between two very big tzaddikim at the time is should we pray or should we not pray in the world? Do we rely on Hashem or do we not rely on Hashem? Because either Hashem put us on this world to toil and to figure out and to do a tikkun and to repair the world and repair our midot and do things, or do we actually battle through that or do we actually have to sit down and pray? The Gemara even says, blessed is a person that can spend his day in prayer. That's way later, obviously, we understand the power of prayer. Heaven, on the other hand, 
doesn't reference the earth, the aspect of toiling and working with your hands to be able to bring out your own labor. He brings an animal. And the animal is a representation of what? The one that goes out to the field. The being that goes out, just as the Jewish people, just as Avram went out into the field, Yitzhak went out into the field, Yaakov went out into the field, as a form of what? Prayer. Because Adam Isha Sadeh, right? As it says that a man is a man of the prayer, which is a reference to field. And is also a reference to prayer, as it's brought down also in the books of Shlomo and Melech. And, uh, and, um, and, and this and this idea, well, the pasuk you were saying is Adam Esh Hatzadeh. Yeah, Adam Esh Hatzadeh. Yeah, the, the, tree, the tree of the field. Yeah. Meaning that, as it also comes about through this tree of life and through these concepts. I don't want to spend too much time on that, but what actually Rabbi Natan is bringing down over here is that the depth of the story, this is just as a parenthesis of Kain and Hevel, is actually to teach us that part of the strength of the Jewish people, and we're going to connect it to Lavan and to Bilam in a second, is their prayer. Okay? Now, why is this so powerful and why is prayer so powerful? You actually end up seeing through the stories and the teachings in the Torah that every single great prophet and tzaddik in the Torah actually ends up becoming what? A shepherd. A shepherd, the one that tends to the animal that Hevel would have brought, a beast of the field, and does what manages them, in what sense? Mystically speaking, it's the concept of the tzaddik that redirects the prayers of Bnei Yisrael. It's a concept of the tzaddik that goes out to the field that is the shepherd, that goes out to go pray, just as Avram was a shepherd, just as Yitzchak was a shepherd, just as Yaakov was a shepherd, just as Moshe was a shepherd, just as David Amelach was a shepherd, and you see it over and over and over again. We don't need to go through all the different types of people. But you'll see this idea over and over again because they were masters of being able to do what? Masters of prayer. Taking the side of heaven. And in fact, we see in the story of Akkad and Hevel that whose korban was accepted, Hevel's korban, meaning what? Rabbi Natan says the argument between Akkad and Hevel is that well, obviously the, the goal of man and the elevation of man, the highest level of man is what? Prayer. Saying that Kain, if, even if you want to work the world and do your masim tovim and do the work of the world, even that, it's not at the level of tefillah. Because tefillah, even according to many people that we discuss, and Moshe and I discuss this all the time, is that tefillah is the highest level of hishtadlut. The highest level of you doing your actual work in the world is you praying to God and bringing God into the scenario to be able to help you. Because you doing the work yourself and not expecting God to help you, every moment that you take a step in the process, that you're not letting God jump in and doing your tefillah or doing your hibodidut, is a moment where you're saying, you're expecting to take on the responsibility yourself that you're going to accomplish the task and not Hashem help you with the task. To show you the degree of how high prayer actually is. People don't respect prayer enough because people think prayer is a form of weakness. It's a form of faith. You don't have enough knowledge. You don't know what's going to happen. But in reality, there's nothing higher than prayer because prayer rectifies everything and is also the level in where you can be able to achieve everything over here. And it's the level in where it was achieved. Go ahead. It says in the Gemara, what stands at the summit of the world is Tefillah. And Rabbi Nachman brings a Torah Nikut in one of the very short lessons. He says that he brings the pasuk from Tehidim, Kurum Zulut Libne Adam. The phrase from Tehidim, as it says, the the pinnacle is disgraced by the sons of man. The what stands at the summit is always disgraced. Meaning Tefillah is something that is like the people mizarzel baze, like they they disgrace it in a sense. They step on it. Tefillah is not something that gets enough respect. And Tefillah, Rabbi Nachman says, is the level in which you can attain Torah, everything else. Tefillah is the all-encompassing level, it's the highest level. And funny enough, um, I was listening to a one-minute class the other day. I was discussing with my mom about this. Rabbi Nathan, he brings the, the connection between Yaakov and Esau. Because what did Yitzchak, when he saw Yaakov walk in to steal the bracha, it says that ya Yitzchak said, Hakol kol Yaakov, Adam yide Esav. Like your, your voice is the voice of Yaakov, but your hands are the the hands of Esav, right? And Rabbi Nathan says that the voice and the hands come from the same source. Meaning what? Kol is Yaakov, Yadaim hands is Esav. What did Yaakov want to do? Was he, he put this stressing on the voice, which is Tfilah. Esav is the aspect of the hands doing things, doing it with this. But the more you emphasize on your voice, the less you need to do with your hands. Rabbi Nathan goes on to say, meaning the more you put act, like, act, like work and effort into your prayer, the less you actually need to do with action. So he's saying one is directly connected to the next. That was just... Um, it's a beautiful point. 
And so, yeah, I, I was just telling Clément that also there's an idea which is connected with that there's concepts with um, opening of hands. If you'll see even, this is a little bit more mystical, but there's Kabbalistic Kameots that are written that specifically draw opening hands that it's a symbolism of being able to receive Shef and Bracha and Parnasa from Hashem through the symbolism of the hands and through that the person opens their hands but necessarily doesn't necessarily have to go toil through it but responds through Tefillah is able to be able to receive and open up from above. Now, it's actually a good segue into the next point that I actually wanted to go to as we start to kind of go into the, some of the secrets over here on what's happening in this parasha, is that there's multiple ways to be able to connect with Hashem and there's multiple ways to be able to understand Hashem and communicate with Hashem. There's a big machloket throughout the history of the Jewish people. It starts even with Adam HaRishon up until, and it's an unspoken machloket, up until really the time until Rabbi Nachman really developed this. And the idea is that how do you call to Hashem? How do you reference to Hashem? If you think about it, we have relationships with people and the way we interact with people and the way we call them, right? You might have someone that I might call my brother. I might have someone that, you know, my parents, I don't call them by their first name because there's a specific relationship that you have with their parents and there's a certain amount of respect. Sometimes there's people that you can even have nicknames with. Sometimes there's a name you might use with someone whenever you're angry with them as opposed to whenever you're trying to play around with them. And there's reasons for that. Hashem is the same way. Now the Jewish people throughout history, we see in the beginning of the Torah, there's different types of names that are being used. Names of Elohim, for example, uh, are names that uh, signify a lot of judgment. Rigueur, as they would say in French, right? Divine judgment that's being brought about in the world. Judgment is not necessarily bad, but it comes from a side of strength. It comes in the Kabbalah from the left side, meaning it comes from a recipient side, which is meant for restriction. So judgment, while it's not necessarily bad, it allows for restriction and it can't allow for the abundance of Rachamim that's supposed to exist in the world. People and Sadiqim interacted with God and knew God with different names of God, okay? Different types of names like Kel, like the name of Hashem that has Aleph Lamed, has a little bit more Rachamim in it. There's different names of Hashem like Shakai, has a more of a combination of the two, has a little bit more Rachamim in it. Yud Ke Vav Ke is the name of God with the Yud, the Hey, eventually the Vav, and then the other Hey, is also a name of God that has a, lot, a tremendous amount of Rachamim in it. And eventually, right, like Kimon was saying, Ekiye, there's Ekiye, Asher Ekiye. There's different forms and different combinations of God when you combine them that can allow for you to interact with God a specific way. Why is this important? Because people wanted to find a way to relate to God and connect with God. Let me give you another example. David Amelech references Hashem and developed a relationship with Hashem that nobody else before him even developed. He references Hashem in Tehidim as a mother. A specific relationship between a child and a mother is a very forgiving and a loving relationship that other people didn't imagine. David Amelach developed that in a way that nobody else developed that. And he allowed for God's grace in the world to exist as a mother for Bnei Yisrael, unlike anyone else before him. Same thing with Moshe Rabbeinu, same thing with Avraham Avinu, in different types of ways. It's very special. Shlomo Amelach did it also in ways of a sister. The same way a person, a sister, or a brother can console with a sister, knowing that the sister has a tremendous amount of patience and love and care for a brother or for another person, the sister as well, Shlomo Melech referenced, developed a form of Hashem that never existed in the world. Now let me tell you a very special story, and, how, and here's how we start to finally get to the end of the class. Okay, as we're going to start to, to get to the end of this. Rabbi Natan came to see Rabbi Nachman a thousand years later, from all these stories and all these understandings of the names of God. And this is in the very beginning of when Rabbi Natan met Rabbi Nachman. I actually, from the person that I heard this story from, from Natan Uzon, he was saying that he thinks that it was the second time that Rabbi Natan had come close to Rabbi Nachman. Already at this point, from the very first interaction, Rabbi Natan and Rabbi Nachman had such a strong connection that we can't even really understand. He had spent multiple days with him and had things revealed to him that we can't even be able to write down in books today. But already at the very few connections that he had with him, he understood that he had to spend the rest of his life with Rabbi Nachman. We had some stories shared on this about how Rabbi Natan had seen Rabbi Nachman in the form of prophecy um, as him helping him out, being able to get closer to Hashem on a very special night when he was with Rabbi Levi Yitzhak of Bardichev. He's a very holy tzaddik that was also in the Eastern Europe area. Um, and through that, when he had seen Rabbi Nachman, he had recognized the face of the man that had helped lift him up. So he already knew Rabbi Nachman was already a very, very special holy tzaddik that was sent in from Hashem, far beyond any other tzaddik that he had met before. And he had met very, very holy people at the time. He already was in the same groups of people that were students of the Magid of Mezrich, um, Rav Zusha, Rav Noam Elimelech, and all people that I just named are incredible masters of mysticism and Kabbalah. So 
Aside from the fact that his father-in-law was one of the holiest people of the side of the Mik Nagdim, and was one of the holiest tzaddikim at the time that knew all of the Torah and was a head rabbi of all of people in all of Europe at the time. So to be able to come to Rabbi Nachman and know from the first interaction of Rabbi Nachman that he was supposed to be his Rav is something already very, very holy. And when he came to see Rabbi Nachman for the second, third time, let's just say the first few times that he had met him, he had come in front of Rabbi Nachman and had expressed himself in tremendous humility in front of the Rav, talking to him about the issues that he had, family-wise, his Abu Dat Hashem, and he started pouring out his heart in front of Rabbi Nachman, and Rabbi Nachman was laughing, and not laughing, but like he was, he was engaging with him, smiling with him, listening to him with an open heart. And after he finished explaining to him all the difficulties that he had, put his hand around him, and he told Rabbi Nathan, why don't you talk to Hashem like the way you just talked to me? Why don't you talk to Hashem like a friend? Rabbi Nathan, after he left that room, changed for the rest of his life. Many years later, he would write in commentary, and he would say, referencing the first times that he had met with Rabbi Nachman, referencing this time, he said, at the moment that Rabbi, Nat Rabbi Nachman shared with me these words, he said, Rabbi Nachman opened up a door in heaven that never existed before, that no tzaddik had ever opened, which was developing the relationship that a man has with Hashem as if he's his best friend. This moment never existed in the world before, through Ibodidut and through talking to Hashem as if he's your best friend. This relationship with Hashem never existed in the world until the time of Rabbi Nachman. It never existed, it was never fostered. Let me give you a basic example to this to prove it. Hashem is viewed unanimously as a king, as a masterful king. In fact, when we say the name of Elohim, whenever we do the tefillah, it's Bala Kohot, it's the man, it's the master of all, it's the master of all strengths and all, all strengths in the world that exist. It's, you're supposed to pray to Hashem with tremendous humility and always bow your head down and always show it in front of Hashem as if you're nothing. Imagine yourself in front of the President of the United States, talking to him and joking around with him and dressing in front of him and, and even engaging with him and even discussing and pouring out your soul in front of him as if he was your best friend. It's not natural to think that way. In fact, it's so not natural that no Jew in the history of the Jewish people ever thought about it that way. Until this moment. Until when Rabbi Nachman opened this door up with Rabbi Natan. Now what's so special about this? There's multiple ways, like we said, to have relationships with people. Okay? And I'm sorry for all these parentheses, but it's going to help bring everything together so we understand Balak and Vinam. There's a concept in Halakha of Beno Levena, talking about a man and his, and his wife, or between a man and a woman. Meaning that whenever we discuss things of Halakha or people have conversations, we say that there's items that are private. It's between man and woman. Meaning that instead of saying that a man and woman have relations or discussing the privacy of those details, we say it's between them. It's the nice, proper way of saying that. The reason why is because it's private. Even halakha goes to say, and there's even mystical people that will say, that even when a man and a woman are coupling together, and they're doing, hopefully, this very special union, that's a very, very holy mitzvah, that even when they're doing it, there's not allowed to be anything in the room at all. Not even a fly, not even a bug. It has to be complete privacy. That's why there's so many halakhot about how it has to be with specific light, lights off and, and, and curtains closed and different types of procedures, just to make it so intimate and so private that it's for no one's eyes. There's a reason for that, because obviously the holiest elevation is in a form where it's only the unification of man and God, right? Now, that's about privacy. There's another concept that's called ben adam lechavero, or beno lechavero, which is the idea of man and man. Whenever it discusses, for example, the halachot that discuss in business, and also the privacy of two friends, how a friend can always confine in a friend, and a man can be able to discuss with his best friend, or a woman can discuss with her best friend. There's another concept that Rabbi Nachman brought down in discussing in halacha, that nobody else really discusses things like this. And he brought down this idea, which is Beno Leven Kono. And he says there's this idea of between man and God. Now Rabbi Natan comes in on this idea, and he says, Beno Leven Kono, he says that a man needs to be with God in his Hidbodidut in privacy. Like he would be with his best friend, like he would be with his wife. Meaning that it's not good. Obviously, when people are learning and they're discussing with their friends, and there's an Indian in Breslev about discussing with friends and talking about the tzaddik and talking about Hashem's greatness and talking in joy and talking in simcha, that you can talk about things publicly. But it's better when you get more into the practice of it, when you do your ibodidut, you don't discuss anything with anyone about your ibodidut at all. Because it's mamash a moment, Rabbi Nachman says in Achai Moran, and he discusses in other books, in the that when you do ibodidut, it's a form of prophecy, it's a form of Ruach HaKodesh. It's the, it's the concept also in Tehidim, which is Hashem that even before you begin the most elevated form of the tefillah of the day, which is the Amidah, the men do three times a day, 
that this highest form of the tefillah, you're beginning it by saying, Hashem, open up my mouth and bring out the words that I'm supposed to say in my tefillah, meaning it's not even me that's going to pray to you, it's you that's going to allow me to pray to you. You're the one that's going to bring out the words for me, meaning it's actual Ruach HaKodesh. Just as in the story that I said in the beginning of the class with the Magid, from the story of Magid Mishaim of Rav Yosef Kao, that whenever he spoke and the angel spoke from his mouth, it's not his own words. It's the words that are coming from Ruach HaKodesh. That the angel is now interacting with them. So this is how deep the process is. Okay? Now, Higodidut is such a very, 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 very high level that people don't discuss it. In fact, most people brush it off as like it's a little concept that Rabbi Nachman brings down or it's a simple idea here and there. But Higodidut is brought about in throughout the whole Torah. We're not going to go through that right now because I can show you hundreds of examples in the Torah about how Higodidut exists. I'm actually going to show you in this week's parasha how Higodidut exists. Now, he bodied it is so powerful, and tefillah is so powerful, Rabbi Nachman writes in Sefer Amidot, that tefillah, the power of tefillah, the power of a Jew in the mouth, by Tutolat Hashani and Yaakov, and the power of prayer, why Bilam was so focused on prayer and cursing and using the mouth, is so powerful that one can change their zivug. It says in Gemara Sota, in the beginning of Sota, I think it's 2, 2A, two I believe, that it says that 40 days before a person's conception, it's decreed in heaven, there's a batkul that comes up, that this person's going to marry this person. That Hashem, it also says in different parts of the teachings, and many people bring it down, I believe it's also brought down in the Zohar, Rabbi Nachman talks about it, how Hashem is the one that's mezavek zivugim the whole time. The Gemara discusses that as well. Hashem spends his time doing what? Doing zivugim. Essentially pairing Jews with each other. Tefillah is so powerful that the actual judgment of Hashem, that a, mo that a person is supposed to marry another person, we don't even need to understand too much Kabbalah to understand how powerful this is. That the marriage union of one man and another woman, their souls that both need to be rectified, that they both need to help each other, that through all the rectifications of all their previous trees and branches of their rectifications of the people before them, and all the generations that are going to come before them, are perfectly bound to be a marriage union, and your tefillah can change that judgment that Hashem already decreed before a person was conceived. Just to show you the degree of how powerful tefillah is. Okay? Rabbi Natan says, and now we're going to finally get to the answer. Rabbi Natan says that tefillah is so powerful, and he bodied it is so powerful, that now let's look at Balak and Bilam. Balak, we know, as the Zohar said, he had a secret that the Zohar was discussing. He had a secret that he comes from the concept of Lot. How do we know this? Because Avraham, when he was talking with Lot, there was a separation whenever they were looking at taking a certain amount of land and direction and things that they wanted to do. And Avraham said something in a form that he would separate himself. And if you look at Rashi's, Rashi's commentary says he separated himself from Lot, not making the same decision as him. So Lot has this sod that he's going to eventually pass on to Balak. This is the sod of what? Separation. Because when Lot saw that Avraham separated himself from other people, he said that I'm going to learn that the Jewish people are protected by separation. The Jewish people separate themselves. That's what Kedusha is, right? If you look at it. That's also what the concept of Tefillah is. It's a, it's a form of separation. If you look at the different types of Shabbat and Kodesh, Kodesh is a form of separation. Ben Kodesh Lechol, everything is a form of separation. Okay? There's a lot, by the way, on that in the parasha that we were reading a couple weeks ago about the story with... Um, what were we reading two weeks ago? No, with um, the story about uh, Korach. Korach was essentially trying to be able to create a separation between the Jewish people and the tzaddik. And that's what Moshe was trying to repair. So there's a lot of things over there as well. But you see the separation of the tzaddik, separation from Hashem, separation from the Jewish people. Halakha creates a formation. If you look at it, the rabbis, they tried to create laws to create separations between good and bad. If you look at the story with the tree, uh, when, when, uh, when Adam and Rishon ate from the tree, it's a separation between good and evil. You'll see this concept of separation. And what's end up happening over here is Lot recognizes the sod, the secret behind the separation of the Jewish people. And you have Balak that pulls from Lavan, sorry, Bil'am that pulls from Lavan, the sod that comes from what? That comes from Tefillah, because we said Tola Shani, with his interactions with Yaakov. Now if Balak pulls his energy from Lot, and he enters the room and goes into secret with Bil'am to now try to curse the Jewish people, he tells them what? He tells them, I'm going to take the secret that comes from my ancestors. This is what Rabbi Nachman and Rabbi Natan are saying. Which is the concept of what? Hidboded. The seclusion and the separation. And Balak, uh, Bilam is going to take the concept of prayer. And he's going to do what? He's going to seclude himself in prayer. And you're going to see that in this week's parasha, 
there's the times whenever he says, and this is why I wanted to find the source for it. If you look at it in Perigachav Gimel, Pasuk Gimel, Vayomer Bilam Levalak, Hit Yatsev Al Olatecha, Vachal Taulai, Ikra Hashem, Yudke Vavke, Lekrati Udvar Ma Yiraeni, Veigati Lach Vailer Shefi. Okay? Shefi, according to the commentaries, is what? If you look at Rashi, <coughs> the Midrash also brings this down. The Midrash Rabbah says that he what? He went off alone. Bil'am says after he sees that the sacrifices are not accepted, he says, wait over here, Bala, and may, stay by the sacrifices. I'm now going to talk to Hashem, and I'm going to consult with Hashem, and I'm going to go off in seclusion. What he's trying to do is he was trying to do a form of heat body dudes. By combining the secret that Balak brought into the cave with him and brought in to be able to teach him about the seclusion with the secret that he had of Tfila. Rabbi Natan says heat body dude is so powerful that Balak and Bilam did it three times and the Jewish people are still saying the blessing that they said that they tried to curse us with thousands of years ago. That's how powerful it is. It's so powerful Rabbi Natan says, he says that even if you try to curse, it ends up in a bracha. That's how powerful Hashem talking to Hashem is. Let me come back full circle. Rabbi Nachman opened up a door with Rabbi Natan 200 years ago, 210 years ago, a little bit more, to be specific, that we have a relationship now with Hashem like a best friend. That no one else opened up this door. You know what Rabbi Nachman did? Every time a tzaddik opened up a new relationship with Hashem, he freed Hashem of a new relationship that he was able to have. He freed Hashem, per se, of a prison that Hashem had. Rabbi Nachman freed Hashem of the prison of not having friends. And now today, Hashem has the capacity to have friendship because of it, Bodidut, because of what Rabbi Nachman said. Rabbi Nathan says to this point that it's so deep, it's so powerful, that he says, why does the Zohar call this parasha Sefer Balak? That it's considered the book of Balak. Because whenever you do it, Bodidut, it says Hashem opens up a book, Rabbi Nachman says, and he starts writing down all the words and all the letters that you write in. And he changes it all for the best. To the point that Rabbi Nachman, now we can understand why he brought up this concept in Halakha, Beno Leven Kono. Rabbi Nachman and Rabbi Nathan say, Balak, Sefer Balak, Rashi Tevot, Beno Leven Kono, is, safe, is Rashi Tevot, Balak. That's why he says it's a book within its own. It's the book of Tefillah, it's the book of prayer, and it's the secret of what Balak and Binam were trying to do with the Jewish people. They said, if this is the strongest point, and this is the highest point that a Jewish person could talk to Hashem, as if he's his best friend, they knew things that the Jewish people didn't even know, and they knew the moments of destruction. They said, let us take those moments, and let us destroy the Jewish people. And that's why the Zohar says this moment was even more scary than the Jewish people enslaved in the 49th gate of Tumah in Mitzrayim. Why? Because what they do is so powerful, they thought that they could destroy the whole Jewish people. You want to know something incredible? And I'll end with this. Yeah. Rabbi Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> the Ben Ishchai shares with us something incredible. The Ben Ishchai says, we learned through the teachings of the mysticism that we were discussing earlier, that they wanted to curse the Jewish people and use the word kelen to be able to destroy them. The Ben Ishchai says, and he references a Gemara for this. I don't remember the Gemara, so I'm sorry. But I can look it up for you guys after if you want. He says that there's this inyan, the Ben Ishchai says, that when Balak left, sorry, when Bil'am left to go do it, body do it Bil, uh, the Ben Ishchai doesn't say the word, he body do it, but when he says, when he, when he left him, Balak went after him to reveal to him some secrets that he had. And Balak went to Bil'am and he said, since you're going to say the curse is not me because you have the power of speech, because you come from the side of Yaakov, from Lavan, he said, I want you to do something. This is what the Ben Ishchai says. He says, I want you to do the curse of Am Yisrael. So he said, there's a special curse, we're never supposed to do this, where you take the word Yisrael and you read it and you remove letters from the name Yisrael. The Kabbalah teaches us that whenever you say something and you remove letters from it, you remove the energy of the existence of that being. For example, what he wanted him to do is he told Bilam, when you curse them next, I want you to do the word like this. I want you to do Yisrael, Yisra, and then start removing. Remove the Lamed, then remove the Aleph, then remove exactly. Do you see what I'm saying? He wanted them to do that. In the process of being able to do that, he was going to dismantle Am Yisrael because he would eventually get to the point where there's not even a Yud 
And when he finished saying the last pronunciation of Ya, Hashem would have to destroy all of Am Yisrael. That is what the Ben Yishchai says of the real curse of what Balak wanted to tell Bilam to how to dismantle the Jewish people. What is Rabbi Natan? Oh, what is... Um, there's, this in, there's this incredible concept that's considered in Brest of Chasiyut for the people because Rabbi Nachman says that to the opposite strength, if you add, you give life force and you give strength and you give Kedusha to something. So you'll notice that there's a very famous phrase in Breast of Chassidut, within a specific sect of breast lovers, which is, Na nach, nachman, nachman miuman. In that phrase, I'll leave it at this because there's too many secrets to, dis to distribute at this point and people can take it however they want. In it, there's the increasing strength of the last Sadiq that said that he has the Nishamah Moshe Rabbeinu, that is a reference that has the descendants through him that will come Mashiach, that he says through me comes Mashiach, that he's a direct descendant of the Baal Shem Tov, and of course David Amalek, on both sides. And through adding letters to Rabbi Nachman's name, he says, you add strength to my name. And you give me more ability, just as a person could call Hashem, a person called Sadiq to be able to help them with things. So through that strength, the person has the ability to be able to do that. I'll end the class there. And uh, if there's any questions or any details that anyone wants to go through, um, we can leave it over there. But I think that through this, we had a little bit of an idea of being able to really understand the power of one, why it's called after a rasha. And number two, we understand through the strength of how powerful Kid Bodidut can actually be, how a person can change anything that is existing in the world through their simple prayer, through their connection with Hashem, through developing a friendship with Hashem, which never existed in the world before this. So if anybody has any questions, we can take them now. No, no, no. David, I would like just to add a little thing. Yeah, yeah, Amazing, yeah. Amazingly, if you take Balaam really and Balak, nice. yeah. and you take the last letters, it's Amalek. It that's, that's one thing. Chazak. But something very interesting, because you mentioned a, a name, which is the, the Klala that they were supposed to pronounce. Yeah. Kalem. And Rav, Rav Mansour was explaining why this word. Really? And, and that's why I'd like to share with you, because it's phenomenal. Sure. Because he said that Akadosh Baruch who hates, he hates when the Jews are behaving like the Goim, like the nations. And it's exactly that word. Because what, how a, a Goy, which it shouldn't be taken on the, on the bad way, I mean a Goy is basically all the nations. We are, we are called uh, uh, Goy Gadol, mm -hmm. Israel. So the Goim, how they are acting, first, before they act, it comes from their liver, then it goes to their heart, and then it goes to their brain, and that's the, how they act. And that's why it's that word, because kaved, it's the, the, kaved. the kaved, it's, the, it's the liver, lev, it's the heart, and moa, the brain. So that's kalem. But how a Jew is acting, exactly the opposite. Melech. It and makes melech. Because we start with the moa, then it goes to the lev, and then it goes to the kaved. So we are we are melech. We are we are basically the son of, of the king. Chazak. And that's why that word was very very uh, dangerous for us. But that's not me, it's Rav Rav Chazak, Chazak, Chazak. So that's very interesting. And earlier you said something that I, I just learned from. This is a Rav but. Regarding the Korban, not, the Korban is a way that we can get elevated and get closer to Hashem. Mm -hmm. And the Korban of Cain was a higher Korban than the Korban of Evel. The problem, from what I understood, was the Kavana. Because there's nothing higher than linen. The proof is that on the on Yom Kippur, the Kohen Gadol enters into the Kadosh HaKadoshim wearing yes, only yeah. linen. Yeah. And Rav David Menashe was saying, now if you take korban and you and you do it in in a gemat, you, you just put it on, uh, you you expand it, so you take the letter, so korban, you take the kuf, so cool. it's, if, if the the last letter is a is a pay, mm -hmm. then you take the resh, it's a shin, mm -hmm. then you take the bet, it's a tab, <coughs> then you take the nun, it's a nun, it makes pishtan, pishtan is linen. Wow. So it's really amazing how basically this is a very very high. Uh, Korban, but the thing is that his intention was not there, and that's why Hashem rejected it. And it's funny that you, you say that because they brought Korbanot specifically, which can be tied into the fact that they're trying to bring this to yeah. to counteract the negative energy yeah. of the of the silk, which comes from the Tula Chani, right? And then you can connect that with Yaakov, and also 
linen is directly tied also to the and side of Balak. Like, what? Don't they say that when you wear linen, it's against Ainara. Ainara. Exactly, I was going to go there. Because Yosef, it says that Yosef, when he approached Paro, I think the Midrash says this, he was covered in linen. After he came out of the jail cell, he purposefully wore clothing of linen. And when Paro saw that he wore linen and he also wore linen, he knew that this is a person that understood the mysticism behind the linen blocking Ainara. So that's why people also specifically wear linen on Shabbat and stuff like that. Um, and there's some mysticism in that. Me to the point that that's why they were believing that power was a god because all the mischief, all the, 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 the magician were cursing him yeah. and he was not dying. Why? Because he was wearing linen, linen at all times. Yeah, yeah that's, yes. and that's the, what that was the secret of power. That's why he told, he told uh, uh, Yosef, I'm going to bring, um, if you don't tell my secret, you will become vice king. Because an Hebrew, the best thing that he could be, it's a, a slave. Because yeah. he told him, the day you're going to tell my secret, Basically, you 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 will die too because they will also remove your your linen and they will they will curse you and they will they will kill you. So it's very very, very yeah, well, interesting. All linen or is like part part linen somewhere? Well, they were like they had linen. a kind of jellaba. They were fully covered uh, with with linen. Yeah. We should wear them for wedding so we don't get ayin haram when we go out. <laughs> <laughs> no, people are some people are very uh, ayin hara and a lot of the negative energy that that used to exist back then doesn't really exist in the same way that it does today so a lot of that stuff is gone. yeah yeah you know so i don't have to wash my face all the stuff with the negative black magic i mean we can go through yeah, stories yeah. of uh um, yeah, yeah. writes a lot though but i know yeah so you should walk in a in a cemetery and you should say 99 percent of the graves died because of Ainara. Yeah. people died because of Ainara. Yeah. even the gemara says that 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 99 percent of people pass away before their time because of Ainara. Oh, no. now the thing about it is is that you want to know the beautiful thing about some of the teachings of Rabbi Nachman of Breslev, just to be able to make it applicable and helpful in these situations, is that the two main teachings of Rabbi Nachman of Breslev, one of them, you know, one of the ideas is Hibodidut, which we discussed tonight, the power of it. But one of the things you do in Hibodidut is the concept of Azamra. Azamra is the idea of finding the good, okay? It, it quotes a passage from Tehilim, Azamra le'elokai be'odi, as I will, uh, you know, I will sing to God with my little bit, Meaning that when you find yourself in a dark place or you see something bad in someone else, you start to find the good in them. The concept of Azamra is to only find good. The beauty of that is, is that Ainara is this idea of bringing about negative energy because you're seeing bad. It's about bringing bad because you're seeing bad, because you want bad, because you're doing bad. Azamra and the teachings of what Rabbi Nachman is saying is start dismantling all of that and start only looking at the good only start finding the good in yourself only start find only starting looking at the good in other people because when you do that in heaven you change all the things that happen and there's even concepts in their teachings and Likut Yavan Moshe could talk to you about it in more detail because he did a class on this but you can even see a person do an Avera judge him well through Azamra and in the Shamaim Hashem will point to you as the judgment as you being the one having judged it well, and they will judge it as if he didn't do an avera, because you found the good. It doesn't mean to say the sin is the sin is bad, obviously, but of it course. means to find the good in the person. And when you do that, you literally he says it like Ramash, you physically change the scale to the side of guilt, to the side, from the side of guilt to the side of merit. Wow. And that's a big, big inyan. It's it's the foundation of blasphemy. Bas um, Azamra, which is Torah 282 of the Kutum It's What does Azamra mean singing? No? I will yeah. sing. I will sing. That's a source of I will singing. sing with my little bit of good. And then it goes into a little bit more to explain to you how to find the good. And then uh, there's so much of it, it's very, all of self help really is founded in this idea of finding good within yourself. That you can do it, you believe in yourself, you can do things, self affirmations. All of it is founded in a lot of these concepts. So, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, go ahead. No, it's a big, it's a big idea. He brings a pasuk in Tehillim. He says, um, um, it's the, I forgot the beginning of the pasuk. It's, um, it says in Tehillim. It says with a little bit more, he's no longer a rasha. You will look at his place and he's not there. What that means is, because of your doing as an or finding the good in that person, that little bit of good that you found in him, he's no longer a rasha. You'll look at his previous place, his previous position where he was, meaning that status that he was at, Rasha, even Rasha Gamor to say, a total wicked person, but Venenu, it doesn't exist anymore because of the fact that you found good that, that completely washes away his status. And actually, Rabbi Nachman goes further. Uh, when you find the good in a person, you will allow this person to do Teshuvah. Yes. Wow. So, yeah. 
Yes, it's very, it's yeah. very, so we it's have very to deep. really the it's minute you concept. give an opportunity to someone to look at the good, you give him an opportunity to come back to Hashem. It's incredible because the Jewish people, like we said earlier, there's relationships. I'm so happy you brought that up. But we said earlier, there's different relationships and interactions with Hashem. There's a commentary that says, where is Hashem, right? One of the names of Hashem is Makom, right? Place, He's everywhere, we know. Um, there's this idea that God could be found everywhere. Some people will even comment and say, God is everywhere, you let him in, right? Which is a nice idea, right? Where do you want to let God in? Do you want to let God in? What about you let God even in into the secrets when you messed up, when you sinned, in a place that you're ashamed? Do you let God in there? You should. You want to know why? Because it's a form of azamah. It's a form of finding the good. Because then that place will no longer become evil. God in reality, people need to understand this. God hides himself in every single place. There's no place in the world that is devoid of God. It doesn't exist. In fact, even in the most impure places in the world that exist, a murder house, a slaughterhouse, a whorehouse, whatever you want to name, whatever the worst sin you can imagine, Hashem is existing there too. And people need to understand and find that. Part of the chassidut, what the Baal Shem Tov brought down into the world, is to explain and teach people that we have to elevate from the destruction and the dismantling and the things that we've done wrong in those lower levels to elevate them and bring them back up those sparks and those good things that happened. And those good points, those nitzotzot shel kedusha, those good points. So how do you do that? Through this idea. Now the beauty of it is, and the powerful thing is that the Jewish people used to only react and relate to God in a way that was like, and, and they were right because they learned this this old way. And if you didn't know any better, you wouldn't do anything better. There's the master of the world. He created the world. There's a bunch of black magic. There's a bunch of chaos that's happening. God said, keep Shabbat. These are the halachot. This is the thing. You should put your head down. You should never open up your mouth if you're never spoken to. And you should be very careful. And you should be very precise and very humble in front of God at all moments. It should be a very scary experience to believe in God. If you genuinely think about it from a very logical perspective. You would never think of, of finding God in, in, in simcha and in difficulty. That's why really finding God after you have yir'ah and you've mastered real fear of God and awe of God and recognizing God to then also master love of God while you will never deviate in any way is an incredible level. It's not just ava like, oh, I love God, like God's my chiller, but then like I might go like, you know, I'm eating in a non-kosher dairy restaurant, but like I don't eat meat out, you know, like, but God still loves me. That's a good mentality to have. But it's not true yira and it's not true ava. It's levels that Peter needs to work on to be able to get to those levels and it requires a tremendous amount of self-work. Now, I'll get to your question in a sec. When you're developing that relationship with God, the thing that's crazy is that when you understand that, you realize that it's very hard to have a very, very loving and, and, and affectionate relationship and a lot of azamha and a lot of love. You have to have a lot of mercy on yourself to be able to get there. You gotta work on yourself a lot. You gotta find the good. Rabbi Nachman tells you, you gotta reinforce yourself. To go even further, what was incredible, what my mom was saying, is that not only when you did something wrong, it was seen as wrong before the way other people used to view it. Now you have the ability to change it into good, but more than that, now you're changing the way that God fabricates and runs the world. It's not that that person did something wrong, he's going to receive punishment. It's that person did something wrong and God is embracing him in love, changing his deen and giving him the opportunity now to change his path and do tshuva just because you decided to find the good in someone else, just because you decided to find something positive and go against your instinct of like, I've been keeping Shabbat for a very long time or I'm working on myself with my Brit or I'm working to keep kosher and I'm with someone that they also are working on themselves, but you know what? I saw that they were a little bit lazy tonight and they decided to order out from their favorite sushi restaurant that's not kosher. So you know what? I had a bad thought against them. Why? Because I'm working on myself, I didn't eat it, so why, do they, why are they better? And what if an angel came down on the spot and said, you know what, I want to reward both of you because you've both been doing very, very well. How would you feel if your best friend that that night ordered not kosher sushi and the angel wants to give the same reward to you as to your best friend, even though you held strong, the same reward. How do you feel? You're like, but I did so much more work. Why? Why him? But the truth is when you start studying the teachings of Rabbi Nachman, you start to realize a tremendous sense of humility and you start to realize that there is nothing that you could say about those types of moments. And in fact, it brings you even more joy that even in his sin, he receives the same reward as you would receive. And you're humbled by the fact that you even have a reward. So it's a changing of perspective to be able to find good in people and changing and finding good in yourself. And I think that that's really the massive takeaway that's incredibly applicable, but also very deep from this week's Basha. So you had a, you had a question that you wanted to ask? It wasn't, it wasn't really a question, it was just a comment. How you, I, just, I just started putting all this together as you were speaking, how... In the Torah, when the pro the prophets would speak to God, like you said, it was very exact, very proper. Yeah. N nothing, no, no word was put out of place. 
And now we can speak to Hashem like, like he's our best friend. Because why? He's concealed and hidden. So we're not scared and, 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 and in a sense, of, with complete respect. But we're not shaking, right? Because we're able to relate to him because he's, he's concealed. Yeah, you can also have a huge task because if you really think about it, that that it says something amazing. There's not one place where God is not. God is everywhere in every atom, every everywhere, but he's hiding. So basically, our mission, which is phenomenal, to find it's him. to reveal. It not even to find him. It's to reveal him wherever he is, even in the worst places. You can reveal. Hashem. Yeah. So it can become like a, a game, but uh, with with lots of respect. Of course. But to it's re that. yeah, it's to, exactly that. To reveal him wherever he is, because yeah. he is there. But if you don't reveal him, basically he's not there. He's not there because you don't you didn't reveal him. He's there, but he's not revealed. And and we have that power to reveal God everywhere. Yeah. It's, it's a, phenomenal. It's an amazing concept. Or in every action that you do. Yeah. That's a that's a brasev inyan. That's the essence of brasev. It's the idea first finding the good points. That's azamra. But there's a second Torah which Rabbi Nachman said these two Torahs are two friends, azamra and Aye. Aye is exactly what he said, which is finding the Hashem in the darkest place. And the beauty of that Torah, aside from the fact that azamra is less than two eighty two. And Aye is less than 12 of book two. If you add 282 plus 12, you get 294, which, uh, 294, which is Gematria Breslev already. But Aye is the idea of whenever you sin, even there Hashem is there, but it's your job to reveal Him. Yeah. And what's the tshuva? How do you do tshuva from a sin? A person does something extremely bad, right? The worst sin. How do you do tshuva? It's the scream from that low place that rectifies that entire fall and makes it into a mitzvah. Which is funny enough, what I was studying lesson 22, and it's all connected today. Rabbi Nachman says, Yerida tachlita aliyah. Yeah. The fall is for the purpose of the ascent that will follow. But why? How? When you do tshuva. And what's the tshuva? How do you make a sin into a mitzvah? Whenever you scream out from that low place and you show God how bad you want to be out of there, that in itself repairs the fall that you did, makes it into a mitzvah, and makes everything white. Which is beyond, it's a, it's, it's, this awesome. is why it's a Torah of the Mashiach. Because the Mashiach is going to find the good in every Jew. That's why, uh, from Yachida. I mean, it's hard to, uh, of the addition was extremely close to, to, to Rabbi Nachman. Was saying, one day he was talking to God and he said, have you ever seen a Jew <laughs> Offering a seuda after he did an avera does not exist because at the time that he's doing it, he already regrets it. Yeah, that's I mean I love I love him. It's, it's <laughs> really unreal. That's why Rabenu said whenever you're kind of, you're attached to the tzaddik, it's an amazing union, by the way. Love you guys. When you're attached to the tzaddik, Rabbi Nachman says your mitzvot has no hands, or, your sins have no legs. Meaning what? They don't even have the benefit from it after. When you have such an awareness, you realize how much enjoyment you lose from the mitzvah. In fact, you're just doing it because you're, it just become a ruach shtut, it's become a spirit of foolishness, but you don't even receive from the, from the sin. And that in itself is a reparation, which is it's really crazy. It's, a, it's beyond. You know, you know what? I just want to end with one last, one last thought because there's so many beautiful things that, that Clement and Moshe were just saying. To, to tie it all in, you know, whenever you're, whenever you're, whenever you're connecting with God and you're doing your equality duty and you're doing whatever you need to do, and you're speaking to God, like Clément was saying, when you, it's your job to reveal godliness in every aspect of the world. So what Rabbi Nachman says, he says you were put into this world to be able to bring out God's kedusha in the world, to bring Hashem's divinity into the world. So the beauty of it is, is that through when you do that, you have the opportunity to decide how you want to do it, how you want to live your life. So that's the really, that's the, that's I think the most beautiful thing is that if you decide you want to bring Hashem's glory into the world today, you can do it. If you want to bring Hashem's infinite rachamim into the world, you can do it because you're deciding that I'm bringing Hashem of rachamim down. If you decide that you want to bring Hashem, if you decide that you want to bring Hashem's judgment into the world in a good positive way that Hashem should judge the Jews favorably through your respect and your humility in front of Him, you're able to do that. But Rabbi Nachman opened up the door of friendship because he's saying that he's going to make it to the point that Hashem hears you as if it's your best friend. And it actually gave me a lot of encouragement because recently I've been doing a lot of Hidbodidut and I've been very down with my Hidbodidut. I've been very, I haven't been able to speak to God in the way that I normally am. And I'm not in the mood and I'm very lazy. 
and I feel very down and it feels very trivial, but I do it every single day because Rabbi Nachman says it's important and I really work on it and I see a lot of benefits from it. And it's, and it's truly incredible because sometimes when you're in it, you, you wake up with a tremendous amount of love for God and you start talking about everything and you pour out your heart. But when I realized today and I learned that Rabbi Nachman opened up the door as having God as your friend, I learned, I learned and I really opened up a door that I realized that now I actually have the opportunity to actually have a real relationship with God as if he's my best friend. Like in a completely new way that I never had before. And for me, that was very, very novel. And it actually encouraged me that now I actually felt like I get to sit in the room that it's as if per se, as if we could even say something as ridiculous as this, that we're freeing up and giving Hashem the opportunity that we are Hashem's friend. That we now give the consolation to Hashem, if you could understand that. That's what Rabbi Nathan says. Actually, Rabbi Nathan says. That, we, that Hashem never had someone to console him. Hashem never had someone as a friend until now. He said that if everybody were doing what they do, so Hashem would not have any bad judgment in the world. No bad judgment in the world. So all the war, all the bad things that are happening is because people are not getting close to Hashem. Sikhot he writes, he says, whenever a person does his body dude, God throws everything out and just listens to him. And once you stop, then he gets back to his job. But if you are busy doing <laughs> Yidbo Dudu, he cannot write a judgment in the world. <laughs> Straight up, I showed you in Sikhot It's un- No, no, it's funny. <laughs> but that's why it's a myth. It's so powerful to feel for Hashem. Yeah. You feel like all, so many people, unfortunately, that, that are so lost, so lost intermarriage and are, are, are not, and they're not continuing the lineage of Judaism. Like you just feel so bad. Yeah. Hashem showed himself at Har Sinai. He showed himself with all the miraculous things. He saved so many people, and and yet this is how the world has has, has been coming. And like you can really feel the pain he goes through. Hashem. That's a level of David Amelech, where he said, "I don't want the Mashiach for me. I want it for Hashem to redeem the Shekhinah from the Galut." That's the thing. Yeah. That's a, that's a level. Like doesn't come for that's, us. It's coming first to free the Shekhinah, and when the Shekhinah is free and go back to the world, then we are free. But it's not like Masha is coming and I stop paying my bills because, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's the... That's, the reality check. Yeah. Chazak Obot to everyone that, that participated. I, I love the collaboration at the end. It was really, it was really beautiful. May we, uh, may we all be blessed and hopefully be able to connect with Sadiqim and, and see the Mashiach soon in our days. Amen. 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 Amen